Brexit. Natural gas conversion and related topics. And the block of papers which we are going to discuss this morning and this afternoon, in going to, we are going to deal with the topic of uh, uh, fissure tropes uh, synthesis. Uh, to introduce the topic, we, we are going to have a keynote lecture from uh, uh, Professor uh, Enrique Inglesia. And uh, to introduce Enrique properly, I would have to give a separate lecture because he has a very long uh, list of impressive achievements. So I decided just to uh, talk about the, uh, just to give a summary of a summary of his, his achievements. Uh, Enrique is a professor of chemical engineering at the University of California at Berkeley and a faculty scientist in the E.O. Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory of the U.S. Department of Energy. He uh, joined the department uh, after 11 years with Exxon in 1993. Uh, he's editor in chief of uh, uh, the Journal of Catalysis and four years ago, at this meeting, he received the Paul Emmett Award in Fundamental Catalysis. Uh, surprisingly, uh, in spite of the, the, his numerous engagements, he has time to, to do research. And uh, he uh, uh, co-authored in more than 130 papers in, in journals and 29 patents. And uh, he's going to introduce the topic of uh, fissure tropes and he's going to talk about design, synthesis and use of fissure tropes, synthesis catalysts. So, Enrique. Thank you very much. I, uh, I feel somewhat awkward coming in here and attempting to introduce a subject almost 100 years before the first reported fissure probe synthesis event. Nonetheless, I will try to do that, bringing together a mixture of our own work, some of our old work, a little bit at the end, if I have time, of some of the newest work, so new in fact that we don't know where everything quite means yet. Um, first of all, let me acknowledge that part of the work was done in what I call the early days, not of Fisher Tropes, of my early days at Exxon, with three people. Um, too solid. This is having an echo, and I think you can hear me in the back, right? Actually, the air is quite loud. I'm sorry? Be careful. <laughs> So you don't mind the echo, we'll do it with the echo. There are um, three people that were instrumental in my uh, work in this area. Ross Madden, who introduced me to the subject, and Stu Solid and Sebastian Reyes, who taught me quite a bit about inorganic chemistry and process modeling. And then at Berkeley today, with the support from the U.S. Department of Energy, we have uh, uh, started about three years ago a new project uh, covering both cobalt and iron-based catalysts. Later on today, in the afternoon, I will talk about the iron work. Today, I will concentrate on the cobalt work. Uh, since you're in the audience, this needs no, no introduction. Um, this is a general scheme for the conversion of natural gas to a product that we can pump. Um, effectively, what we do is we go through synthesis gas, which is what I call a thermodynamically protected form of methane, one that then I can take, and I can make uh, a set of products with a fairly high selectivity in what is known as the fissure probe synthesis. Those are the three types of catalysts that we normally use. I'm going to concentrate on cobalt because for reasons that I don't quite understand, it's become the most fashionable of all uh, catalysts. This afternoon, I'm going to tell you that it shouldn't be so. But since most of your interest is probably on cobalt, I'm going to concentrate on these kinds of materials. Particles on a support, particles of order 50 to 100 angstroms, normally as metal, but sometimes not. This is sort of a roadmap for my talk today. I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens at the local structure, the local scale of a catalytic site. And I'm going to concentrate on what would be the effect of supports of the size of the cobalt and of the presence of another metal on the rate and then later on the selectivity of the reaction. I'm going to talk briefly about this schematic right here, which effectively involves a chain growth process from which you dissolve the chains either as an olefin or a paraffin in order to either go away from the reactor or do something in the process of leaving that reactor. I'm then going to move to the scale of a catalytic pellet and point out to you that these pellets are normally filled with liquid if you're indeed doing fish probe synthesis and that as a result of it you're going to encounter things that look a little bit strange. Uh, they're going to be diffusional effects that are unavoidable and they're going
going to be problems interpreting the selectivity that are going to require that we go beyond the chemistry into some of the engineering. Finally, I will talk a little bit about how the pellets and the reactors would be designed in order to maximize the selectivity. I will leave you with some remaining challenges. I will leave you with some of our own work in addressing one of those challenges, the so-called effect of water on the rate and selectivity of the reaction. First of all, let's talk about what happens when one changes the crystallized size of a supported cobalt metal catalyst supported on various supports, and one looks at the rate per atom of cobalt, and we plot it against the dispersion. We get a straight line. That straight line means that the rate of the reaction per exposed metal atom is actually independent in this range of size from the identity of the support or the actually uh, change uh, uh, identity of the support and the changes in the size of the crystalline. The fact is that this is not unexpected. If you instead plot a turnover rate, if you now divide this rate by the fraction of the cobalt that is exposed and you calculate a turnover rate, a side time yield, you get again what you expect, that there are no significant effects of support or of the fractional dispersion of that cobalt. You may conclude that this makes the reaction structure insensitive. The fact is it says no such thing. All that it says is that in the range in which I have looked at the rate, it is unexpected that the surface structure and or the presence of the support will be felt in any way by a catalytic reaction. Thus, if you do find particle size effects in this range, you would have to come up with an alternate explanation, one that has nothing to do with changes in structure. This is what is expected. Now, in a moment, I'm going to tell you about some previous work. In the process of doing that, I want to point out that this work was done under conditions that one can truly call fissure tropes, as opposed to conditions that lead mostly to the formation of methane, where most of the previous work had been done. Here is the turnover rate as a function of the fractional dispersion of cobalt um, for our work. And I want to point out that from the early 90s, there seems to be general agreement that when you look at well-reduced materials, materials where the cobalt oxide has been almost fully reduced, by my definition, that is about 95%, that one gets a fairly unchanged turnover rate as a function of changes in the fractional dispersion of cobalt. That has been done for a couple of groups of supported catalysts and for another two groups in the case of differently exposed single crystal surfaces, in which they have also found that the turnover rates are quite similar. There has also been some more recent work in which on various supports, and even in the presence of one of these alloy elements, platinum, the site reactivities as measured by a, an isotopic transient technique are actually quite similar on cobalt, on cobalt platinum, whether they're supported on silica or on zirconia silica. So far, unfortunately, this seems to be telling us that there is not that much that one can do in order to make a cobalt surface atom more active. What you can do is put more surface atoms into the catalyst in order to get a higher volumetric or mass-based productivity. There is actually something that happens as you go out to, to uh, higher dispersions to smaller and smaller particles, and that is that we get a lack of reproducibility, a lack of consistency, and what appears to be a significant extent of reoxidation on the reaction conditions. Reoxidation that is unavoidable if you want to really be operating this catalyst under conditions of significant conversion and where you make significant amounts of C5 plus selectivity. There seems to be a significant barrier in moving out there that has much less to do with a synthetic chemistry for making those highly dispersed and well-reduced cobalt crystallites than with the fact that a small enough cobalt crystallite has a tendency to reoxidize under the varying oxidation potential that you have in a Fischer-Tropsch synthesis reactor. So I would like to propose to you that from what we know so far, there seems to be sort of a limit beyond which you should approach with great care because you are likely to undergo significant changes in the redox state of the material as you make higher and higher dispersions. Let me talk a little bit about bimetallics and let me begin to um, ask the question, how does one make a more dispersed global crystalline? Well, you can change the preparation technique, you can change the support, but you can also move along this line and only along this line by doing a couple of things. One of them is by placing a second metal 
that is well known to be a structural promoter. Rhenium has been widely reported to lead to smaller crystallites. By the way, crystallites, as in the work of Holman, that actually tend to reoxidize because of their small nature um, at um, higher conversions. The other way that you can actually move along this line is by taking a starting material and by treating it in various ways, by being more or less careful in the way that you make the catalyst. For example, if you take an impregnated cobalt on silica catalyst and you mistreat it by taking it in air to high temperature and then in hydrogen at some reasonable but fairly carelessly uh, done procedure, you get a fairly low dispersion, 3%, and very large crystallites. If you avoid the damaging calcination, which leads to the formation of water in the presence of cobalt oxides, you actually get higher dispersions, smaller crystallites. And if you reduce it even more carefully by avoiding the presence of water, by either doing it at a high space velocity of your reducing stream, or by doing it with a slow heating rate, you get even higher dispersions. So a given preparation technique, depending on the protocol that you use for treating the catalyst, will cover a very significant range of cobalt dispersion, a significant range over the range in which the behavior seems normal. The other thing that you must do in trying to do this is make sure that when you deposit the cobalt, it's everywhere within the support pellet. And one of the strategies that we used many years ago in making eggshell catalysts that I will talk about later on was to actually use a molten cobalt nitrate salt so that you never had any of this selective deposition during drying, which is what normally happens with soft saturated solutions. So if I had to teach you how to make a catalyst, this is what I would tell you to do and I would tell you do not work very hard at pushing the dispersion beyond the range at which you can stabilize both that dispersion and the metallic nature of the catalyst at typical Fischer-Tropsch synthesis condition. If you're doing methanation at atmospheric pressure, it may be okay. If you're doing Fischer-Tropsch at reasonable conversions and pressures, it is not okay to go to very highly dispersed materials. I want to show you the only catalyst that I'm willing to, to even claim that it is the only alloy bimetallic component in a cobalt catalyst that has led to a higher turnover rate. This is what happens when you put small amounts of ruthenium, very, very small amounts of ruthenium on an atomic basis. Ruthenium segregates to the surface, that's how it can be potent even at low concentrations. The point is that if ruthenium was just changing the dispersion of the cobalt, it would have moved you along this line. What it does instead is it moves you up away from that line telling you that you effectively have, for the first time, gather a cobalt surface atom that has a higher, apparently, intrinsic activity than what you had before. We don't quite understand, even though this data has been obtained by others and many people have looked at it, exactly how it is that ruthenium does this. What we do know is that there has to be atomic mixing between the cobalt and the ruthenium for you to be able to see this enhancement in the side activity and we have shown that that can be induced by treatment in air. And we have shown that this mixing occurs by using X-ray absorption during reaction. We also think, although I cannot provide you the definitive evidence, we do know that ruthenium inhibits the formation of carbon at high temperature on cobalt. And we suspect that even during reaction, there may be a fraction of that surface that is covered with what has been called beta carbon, which is a type of carbon that is much less reactive than the one that is normally involved during the reaction. That the presence of ruthenium minimizes this to the expense of that, but the direct evidence is not available today to say anything more than for every one of the other alloy elements that we have used, we have never seen anything but a change in dispersion or a change in reducibility. We have never seen an increase in turnover rate except for the ruthenium component. And to be honest with you, we don't understand exactly why. And it is one of the remaining unanswered questions in many uh, in, in this area. Okay, I have told you a fairly simple story about the rate of the reaction. A story that to some extent is less than fully hopeful because it tells you that there isn't that much that one can do to change that intrinsic activity, that all you can do is pack more and more crystallites of cobalt in a given support and to make them so that they are of order 10 nanometers or so. I want to talk about selectivity because there is an apparent contradiction that I'm about to introduce to you. The structure of the material should not affect the intrinsic properties of the surface and when I look at the rate it does not. 
But when I look at the selectivity, all of a sudden it becomes more complicated. And in order to be able to go through this with you, I have to tell you a little bit about how complicated or how involved it is to look at the selectivity of Fischer-Tropsch synthesis, both from the measurement standpoint and from the interpretation standpoint. From the interpretation standpoint, you have to worry about the fact that selectivity depends on residence time. That when you compare catalysts, you have to do it as similar conversions, and that there seems to be a secondary reaction that selectively consumes the olefins without forming the paraffins, and where the olefins are going back onto the surface and continuing to grow. The chains become larger as you let the products sit there longer, because these molecules get a second chance to grow. If you uh, allow them a second chance to grow, they will continue to do so and eventually would come out as a higher molecular weight product. And you can check that this reaction is taking place by adding olefin into your hydrogen CO feed, by uh, looking at the fraction of the olefin that is hydrogenated versus initiate chains. And you have to be careful how you do this. You have to be careful how you do this because there's something called a water effect in this chemistry. And that water effect, among other things that it does, it inhibits the hydrogenation of the olefins. So if you put the olefins at the inlet, there's no water. Unless you bypass the inlet or you add water with the olefin, you will actually get an amount of hydrogenation that is inconsistent with what actually is taking place during the reaction. When you do that, you find out that indeed the reabsorption takes place. Now begin the inconsistency. Here are two catalysts. Slightly different dispersion, a factor of three, but nonetheless in a dispersion range where you should not get any effects of the size of the crystallite on the selectivity, and yet what we find is that the C5 plus selectivity, which increases with conversion because of this secondary reabsorption, is lower on this sample than it is on that sample. So if the particles are really this large, and if the size of the particle doesn't affect the rate at which you make monomers, why all of a sudden? It affects the way that you grow the change. Why is the selectivity different as you change now the nature of the catalyst? Well, there are more puzzles, actually. The next one is that if you have a chain growth scheme, like the one that you have here, in which a chain growth and then terminates for a normal polymerization type process where the chain growth probability is independent of size after the chains get large enough, you should actually get what is called a Fourier distribution. Well, it turns out that if you look at a full range and look at where the range is here, this is the logarithmic plot that normally would give you a straight line for a Fourier distribution over a carbon number range that went all the way to C100. Here's the measurement challenge in the fischer synthesis. What you get is you get neither a straight line nor a distribution that is independent of residence time, of conversion. There is something that changes as you change the size of the chain that causes that curvature, and there is something that changes as you let the olefins sit there longer or shorter periods of time that makes these two figures right here be offset from each other. Well, if you want to be really nasty to your data, what you do is you take it away from your logarithmic plot. That's the way we hide our inadequacies in getting data. And what you do is you say, because I have the entire distribution, I can for the first time calculate a chain termination probability for each one of the chains. And I do that by calculating everything to C200 or C300 and then counting every one of the chains as they come up. The advantage of doing that is that you get this kind of linear relationship. This is the termination to orphans. This is the reverse of that process. And that's the irreversible termination to paraffins. The question that you want to ask is how do these things change as you change the carbon number? This is what happens when you go to a linear plot and you look versus carbon number at the olefin termination, the net termination to olefins, this minus that, and the one to paraffins. The chain termination to paraffin is independent of chain size, as you expect from a fluorine type kinetic process. The termination to olefins decreases with chain size because apparently not this one is changing, but this one is becoming more and more probable as you go to larger and larger chains. Now, if you want to look at this in a systematic way, you have to ask the following question. What would influence the extent to which a product 
that can go back and reverse a step, okay, actually does that. It depends on how rapidly you remove it from your catalytic reactor. And that will be dependent on the reactor residence time, as I show you here. However, if you now go and look at one of those pellets inside that reactor, what you find is that you have yet another challenge, and that is to leave that pellet to effectively, which is, where effectively you have a fairly heavy liquid and a fairly high molecular weight often that is trying to come up. And when you do that, you begin to talk about properties of the pellet, like the diffusivity, like the, the size of the pellet, the number of cobalts that you have in the pellet, and the diffusivity and the reactivity of the olefins. That determines how fast they get out, and therefore how likely they are to go back and do something like reinitiate a chain and continue to grow. Well, that's what we did mostly with Sebastian Reyes by putting together a fairly systematic model of a three-phase reactor in which we took into account what happened at the scale of the bed and what happened at the scale of the pellet. And we tried to identify first, as we look at this pellet, what are the relevant parameters that would affect the relative rate of transport and reaction for each one of these olefins. And when you do that without actually going and solving the equation, what you find is that there are characteristic times for a reaction and for transport that depend only on two sets of parameters here. A set of parameters that depends on the molecule and a set of parameters that depends on the catalyst. This will determine the extent to which a diffusional restriction will affect the reabsorption of an alpha olefin and therefore to what extent it would change the chain growth probability. Well, let's look first of all at the effect of the molecular parameter. The molecular parameter is the reactivity of an olefin divided by the diffusivity of that olefin. And what this says is if this depends on carbon number, and we know that larger olefins are more reactive, and we know that larger olefins diffuse more slowly in the context of what we're doing here. Therefore, if this parameter decreases, by a certain amount as you increase the chain size, you can effectively predict that this will decrease the chain termination to olefins with carbon number, because this parameter is changing with carbon number, but this one would not be affected at all. Now, I have to be honest with you, the way that you do this is effectively by measuring a few of the olefin reactivities and then try to get correlations like the wilkie chain equation for the diffusivity. However, once you do it once, once you have taken one catalyst and you have calculated what this dependence is, you're not allowed to change that when you go to the next catalyst, all right? So you fit it once and you take it from there. The question that you ask now is remember the income scope. And I, I wanted to make a pitch for my coworker Ross Mann on Wednesday in the fundamental section. He's going to deal with an issue that I do not want to talk here because it actually requires a high level of criticism of other people's work and I want him to have the chance to do it rigorously. The fact is that this is caused by lower mobility and higher reactivity of the larger olefins, not because they're more soluble or they physics are more strong. If you really are interested in that burning question, which about three or four of you in the audience may have, you should come and listen to his talk, where he's going to deal with it rigorously. What I really want to deal with here is what happens now with my inconsistencies. Why could not I be able to, why would I not be able to describe the selectivity using the same parameters for all the catalysts? Why was there an effect of dispersion on the C5 plus selectivity? And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to look at something else here that now depends on the identity of the catalyst. I'm going to look at various supports, at various alloys. I'm going to mix them all together by actually making this now my variable, and I'm going to look at what the data looks like. Okay? Those are all the points that we could not reconcile in the past. This is now a model simulation using only the adjustable parameter that we obtained for one catalyst to now describe the behavior of all the other materials. This is the C5 plus selectivity. As I make the pellets larger, as I put more cobalt, or as I make their pores smaller, they're more able to reabsorb the olefins, and therefore you get a higher molecular weight product. Well, the title says it all here. Yeah? The fact is that if you push this parameter too high, you actually get the opposite trend. And the question is why? You have made it more and more difficult for the olefins to get out, and at the same time as you're doing that, you're making it more and more difficult for the CO to get in. 
The CO is the one that provides your monomer for chain growth. As you begin to deplete your CO, your C5 plus selectivity goes down rather dramatically. Your methane selectivity now increases, and therefore you end up with an optimum range over which you can exploit as much as you can the desirable reabsorption of all offense, but you do not get yet the monomer depletion that is associated with the CO trying to get in. Now you have to be able to describe this in a rigorous sense without adding any additional parameters, and that's what you get by effectively putting the known diffusivity for hydrogen and CO in these materials. You're left now with a practical problem. The practical problem is how do you make catalysts in this range, given that I already told you, you have to make them about 10 nanometers, and you have to pack as many as you can in there. What can you change? You can change the size of the pellet. You can change the size of the pellet, okay? However, when you do that, and by the way, this is the methane selectivity using the same models, only to show you that it's not just C5 plus that we're able to reproduce. The point is that out here you have powders, out here you have pellets, okay, and somewhere in between, is where you want to be for a typical catalyst. If you have a packed bed reactor, you have to be here. If you have a bubble column reactor, you may have to be here, but not too far there, because then you'll have filtration problems. How can you move yourself from one end of the spectrum to the other one without changing the crystallized size, or the pellet size? This is how you do it. Remember, L, which I took to be the size of the pellet, is not really the size of the pellet. It's a diffusion distance is how far you have to get into that pellet to either get the orphans out or to get the CO to come in. So the way you decouple the size of the pellet for hydrodynamic reasons from the diffusion length for reasons of how to control the chemistry is by actually locating the cobalt only in certain regions and that raises two challenges. One of them is how do you make them, how do you keep them that way, and how do you characterize them after you have made them. That's not the challenge that I want to address. I just want to tell you that we can do that, and that if you take a 2.2 millimeter pellet that you place in a packed bed reactor like this one, it is unfortunately there. But if you begin to make the eggshell thinner, you can move yourself through almost the entire range of this parameter by changing nothing more than where in the pellet you put the cobalt. That's how you decouple this two. Okay. Um, because some of you have seen some of what I have talked about, and we have argued about it before, I wanted to leave a little bit of time at the end to isolate for you what I view to be the remaining challenges in this area, the things that are not as comfortable to me as the ones that I have talked about, and the things that I worry that if one day we're going to practice this commercially on a large scale, we'll come back to haunt you because we don't understand them well enough. First of all, as far as the number of sites, make as many as you can and pack them as closely as you can and keep them that way. But don't work on trying to make them smaller and smaller because they will neither stay that way nor will they remain metallic under any reasonable Fischer-Trope synthesis conditions. Try to distinguish between what is a turnover rate, or let me put it another way, what is a site reactivity effect of a bimetallic and what is a site preservation effect or a site protection effect. When you add a second component in here, there are many things that could happen. You, you may be able to reduce the catalyst to a greater extent, you may be able to disperse it better, or you may actually be able to make it more active on a per site basis. Try to distinguish among those three and the techniques that are available to begin to be able to do that. What is the role of ruthenium, the only material that I have been able to find from the literature that unequivocally increases the apparent site activity? Is it a site activity increase or is it a fact that we're retaining a larger number of the cobalt in the active carbon pool rather than the inactive carbon pool? I can't answer it very clearly right now. And finally, what I did tell you and what I think is fairly clear is that after you have run out of things that you can do with the chemistry, which is to put more sites and to try to reinforce the ability of cobalt to do cobalt-type fissiotrope synthesis, you're still left with some variables here that we didn't have before. Because those variables you can actually change by changing the size of the pellet, by putting the cobalt in a certain location, or by changing some of the physical properties of the material. So you have added an additional variable that you did not have 
whenever we thought that fissure tropes was just going to a surface and coming out without any secondary reactions. I would like to spend the last 10 minutes of my talk or so talking a little bit about one of those challenges. The challenge is, what is the mechanism? One of the things that is most frustrating about fissure-trope synthesis is that if I go to the literature today, I will find 10 to 12 rate expressions that can simulate the experimental data, and only a few of them would actually be consistent with a set of elementary steps, and therefore, are they extrapolatable, and are they really, are they really able to go beyond the data set that we're describing? I'm not going to provide many answers. I'm going to leave you with some questions, but I want to take you with, through some of the unknowns. If you look at those 10 rate expressions out there, I think all but one have no effect of water whatsoever on the rate of the reaction. And yet, if you look at the literature, the first report was actually a patent by Shell, in which they reported that the addition of 25% water decreased the methane selectivity. Then there was a patent from Chang Kim from Exxon in which they added water and they saw the same decrease in methane selectivity. This is effectively keeping everything constant and adding water to the feed. And they also saw an increase in the rate of the reaction. Much later, we made some measurements on a cobalt titanium catalyst and we saw the increase followed by a decrease. The decrease is due to site inhibition, it's due to occupation by water. The question is, what could it be about water that leads to a higher rate than in the absence of water? fischer tropes is a fairly forgiving reaction. You go to higher conversion and everything gets better. The olefin reabsorbs, the methane goes down because of the water effect, and sometimes the rate even increases. That's not bad for, in comparison with many other reactions. Now, if we look at the, um, at the methane selectivity, we also see the same thing that Shell reported, the same thing that Chang King uh, reported. The question is why? Okay. Is it because water in the gas phase is able to communicate with the surface and is able to introduce new reaction pathways for the activation of CO or the formation of the monomer, which is what I show here by introducing in a set of largely irrelevant elementary steps. I don't want to discuss the detail. A step that takes carbon and takes you somewhere by a parallel pathway. Okay. Is that why water increases the rate of the reaction? Or is it that when you have water, in the same way as I think that ruthenium may be acting, you actually are shifting the carbon from a pool that is less reactive to the pool that is more reactive? Is it that in the presence of water you have more available sites for absorbing CO or more available sites for accommodating this active carbon pool? I'm going to give you some hints about what is not, but I'm not going to be able to close the loop for you. Water may introduce removal pathways for removing that less active carbon, and therefore give you a larger fraction of the surface occupied by uh, the reactive form. Okay, here is, I'm, I'm really not, I did not want to pick on this rate expression, okay? And I deliberately wanted to even put the reference, but I wanted to describe it as the state of the art, because anything that came out in the year 2000 must be state of the art, and it's representative of what is in the literature for kinetic rate expressions. Two problems. There's no water anywhere. There's no mechanistic explanation for that rate expression. There's no set of elementary steps that will ever give you that rate expression. It doesn't matter what you put together. You can't explain that, and you cannot explain where the rest, the other side on that numerator needs to be. So I want to consider the alternate monomer formation pathways by doing a set of kinetic measurements. I don't want you to look at all of this here, okay? I want you to just think for a moment what happens if you write a bunch of elementary steps, you do a pseudo steady state approximation, you write a rate expression, and then you do a parity plot. Okay? That's what you get for that rate expression. Now I'm going to give you another one that uses CO instead of carbon as the source. Okay? And this is my data, so I'm going to criticize myself and no one else for getting this data. The fact is that they give me an equally good fit or bad fit, depending on your perspective. The point is, the one that you don't know, is that both of these mechanisms are wrong. And they're wrong because you can actually interrogate this step and this step, and we make the wrong assumption here. Okay? The point is that without independent evidence, we're not going to make very much progress in putting together a kinetic rate expression that is able to, to be reliable and is able to bring together the 12 rate expressions that we have out in the literature. This is not trivial. What you do in this case is you begin to interrogate the individual steps. You ask the question, is the hydrogen adsorption-desorption equilibrated? 
in that? We don't know, except by comparison with a rate expression. No, we do know. Because if you carry out the reaction in a mixture of H2 and D2, and you look at the rate of formation of HD, that is telling you how fast that step is. So what is the rate of formation of HD divided by the rate of the Fischer-Tropsch synthesis is greater than 10. Therefore, that step is cross-equilibrated. And from now on, at conditions of re reasonable Fischer-Tropsch, 20 atmospheres and 200 degrees, we're actually getting mechanistic information that says we shall never question again the reversibility of that step. But we have been assuming all along that the desorption of water is also a cross-equilibrated step. And when you do that experiment, and that experiment is going to involve looking at mixtures of hydrogen and CO with a small but significant amount of T2O, you can actually find that if you look at the amount of deuterium in all of your products or in the dihydrogen, which is quasi-equilibrated with the hydrogen pool, it's here. You need to extrapolate to zero conversion. It should be here if that step was quasi-equilibrated. That means that the removal of water from the surface is actually not quasi-equilibrated, and that raises two issues. How do we handle that in a kinetic rate expression? And what is the oxidation potential on that surface? Because it's not just reflecting what you have in the gas phase. It's reflecting the apparent inability of that surface to remove the oxygen that has been formed in a CO activation step fast enough to be able to be quasi-equilibrated with the gas phase. Two more um, set of data to try to answer the question of what is the effect of water. Here is the effect of water, CO conversion rate as a function of conversion where there's this amount of water here and there's this amount of water here. Okay, you may be wondering why this arrow is here. What I want to do is I want to ask the following question. If there are two parallel pathways and water is effectively responsible for the second one, I should be able to get a different response of this system when I do the following. What I want to do is I want to carry out the reaction with D2 and CO. I want to look for a kinetic isotope effect. It turns out that the kinetic isotope effect, for reasons that we barely understand, it is less than one. It is an inverse kinetic isotope effect. That's not the point that I want to make. The point that I want to make is that the kinetic isotope effect here, where there's a small amount of water and a low rate, is identical to the kinetic isotope effect here, where there's a lot of water and there's a higher rate. And that means that these two steps right here would have to have identical kinetic isotope effects for you to actually have introduced a new pathway for forming the products. And this says that water is not really participating in a parallel pathway for making the CH2. Water must be doing something else. Well, the other alternative is that water is doing something to the available um, pool of carbon. So what we did next was we said, let's look at the surface as it works. Let's do infrared measurements and let's concentrate on the absorbed CO that we have when we have no water and when we add various amounts of water to a catalyst that shows a positive response of the rate to the amount of water. Let's measure the intensity under the CO peak and see that in any way changes as we change the amount of water. And that is what I show you here. You can disregard the first point. There is an irreversible slight increase on that. Look at what happens when we have water. We have more water and we take away the water. There is no change in the dispersion of the cobalt in the number of CO chemisorption sites. So if we're changing a pool of carbon, it's not the chemisorb CO. That is not being changed. It's some other reactive uh, hydrogen source. If we do the experiment at higher temperatures, we get the same effect. The only reason I put that one there, then you get greedy and you say, what happens if you add even more water? Okay? And that's what happens. This is the inhibition effect of water where actually the water begins to compete with the CO and begins to reoxidize the catalyst. Okay? This is the danger of having water. Right? Well, we've also done X-ray absorption measurements that do the same thing. I wanted to point out a set of experiments that we're doing at the suggestion of Alex Bell, and that is to try to go back to a chemical transient approach in which we go from running this catalyst in hydrogen CO with varying amounts of water, we introduce hydrogen and we attempt to interpret now what comes out in that methane peak as a sum of the reactivities of various carbon pools. And when we do that, and I, I won't give you the data because we don't have reliable data yet, but you can clearly identify, as Alex did many years ago, that there's more than one type of carbon on that surface. The challenge for all of us now is to quantify those two types of carbon and see whether indeed they're being affected by water. And I hate to do this, but I'm going to do it. 
Okay? You should stay tuned because the absolute um, elegant experiment to do this is an isotopic transient experiment. Okay? Um, and Chuck Mims within the next few months is going to be give you the evidence one way or the other and I'm not going to um, take that uh, away from his punch. Uh, but the answer will be coming from a combination of these kinds of techniques. Okay, I'm finished. Um, the last part of my talk dealt with these two possibilities, the remaining question of what are the kinetics for this reaction and what is the water effect. We identify some things that complicate the redox chemistry and that we need to worry about and we made some advances in how to at least begin to isolate certain steps in that reaction. And I want to thank you all for your attention. I want to put back up the people that have done the work over the years. And again, in view of the competition with the other session, thank you for coming to this one.
to say what they are. So if we are both in town in the near future, you'll hear about it first. <laughs> Uh, Jerry Spivey, NC State University. Thank you for uh, an excellent talk. I had a question about the effect of water at, uh, for long periods of time. You talked about the instantaneous kinetic effect of water on methane selectivity, olefin reabsorption. What about its longer term effect in an extended run, uh, particularly on the reoxidation of the cobalt? And the second part of that question is would that effect be different if lithium were present? Yeah. I, I really don't have an answer for you, and the reason is that we, we don't normally, you know, I, I tell my students that our catalysts never deactivate, so we never run long enough to, to, to look at that. But I would refer you to the work of Anders Holman, who I think has looked quite carefully at the reoxidation of uh, cobalt. What he does know is that the smaller particles reoxidize faster. I'm not sure why he has not done a cobalt ruthenium. In cobalt rhenium, the effect of rhenium is just to make the particles smaller and reoxidize. But, and the closer you get to having a small particle, the more likely it is that this will come back and hurt in some way. I wouldn't like to create too much disparity with the schedule of the other sessions. Also, possible we are going to have more time. I would uh, like to close this, this paper. Thank you once again, Enrique, for excellent presentation.